Hello and welcome. In this video, we begin the second part of our principal component analysis hands-on. So far, we've already seen the data preparation bit. From here onwards, we will be actually getting onto the real stuff, which means we will be performing principal component analysis in a step-by-step -step way, and we will also be interpreting the outcomes of PCA. So without any further ado, let's get started. If we have correlations in the data, that forms an appropriate case for principal component analysis. Essentially, principal component analysis is used to eliminate the redundancy in the data, but can we statistically validate this as well? So there is a specific test for this purpose, which is known as the Bartlett test. What is the Bartlett test supposed to check? So the Bartlett test checks if the variance covariance matrix is the same as an identity matrix. Now, what is an identity matrix? A matrix which has only the diagonals as ones and everything else is zero. So if everything is zero, that means there is no correlation. Now, remember I said variance covariance matrix. For a scale data, the variance covariance matrix and correlation matrix are one and the same. They're very close. This notice is not available through a default Anaconda installation. So you may have to get the specific library for Bartlett test. The code is provided here. This is available in the library called Factor Analyzer and the class called Calculate Bartlett Sphericity is what we need. Remember in our PCA theory video, we explained when you have a spherical scenario, like a tennis ball kind of a scenario, so it's kind of checking that only how's your data organized in a multi-dimensional space. This particular test would give us the test statistic and p-value. Now, what is the null hypothesis? The null hypothesis is that the correlations are not significant, whereas the alternate hypothesis is that the correlations are significant. If the computed p-value is less than 0.05, we will reject the null hypothesis. So let's just run this test and check it. See, the p-value that we are getting is definitely less than 0.05, which means we reject the null hypothesis. There are significant correlations. This further affirms that this data set is the right candidate for principal component analysis. Just one more check, which is again an assumption related check for PCA that we may want to perform, again from the same library, which is known as the kaiser mayer Auckland test or KMO test. This checks the adequacy of the sample. So everything else is very similar as you saw for Bartlett. It is going to give you a value which is not a p-value, but a value which is compared with 0.5. If this value is below 0.5, notice it is not 0.05, it is 0.5 then we say that we don't have adequate sample, which means we need to collect more observations. But if this value is 0.5 or above, then we have enough data, we can comfortably perform PCA. So just another check, an assumption, a prerequisite for PCA that we are checking here. It says this value is actually greater than 0.5. We can go ahead and perform PCA. It would have been even better if this was greater than 0.7, but with whatever data we have, we can proceed right now. Now, there are multiple ways to do PCA in Python. There are multiple libraries that provide you those inputs, but the one that I recommend to you is scikit-learn because this is to the point. There are places where you'll find people using libraries like linear algebra and a couple of other libraries, but those are not only meant for PCA. That's why I prefer this library because this is a dedicated library which has a class for PCA, which does the work just about to the point. So first of all, we don't know how many principal components we will be extracting. We know that we had seven features after dropping the ID and the band columns. We are going to perform PCA. We are going to extract seven principal components. We are mentioning a random state here just, as, just to ensure that whatever we do is repeatable and reproducible. So at any point in time, if I come back and refresh my code, I should get the same results. If I share my work with anybody, that person should get the same results. This class needs the input, which is number of principal components, and we are just initiating it here. Later on, we are passing our data. We are actually applying principal component, you can say, using fit transform methods. So let me just run this here. This PCA thing has an attribute called components, which will print out the eigenvectors. Now, what are eigenvectors? We've explained this in our theory video. You definitely need to watch it to get more clarity on these common terms that are used in association with PC. So these are the eigenvectors that we have got, which are nothing but the coefficients or the loadings. And we will just interpret them a little better in some time. But one more thing that we are interested in is the explained variance, which is nothing but the eigenvalues. 
So eigenvector in PCA decides the direction of a principal component. Eigenvalue decides the importance of a principal component. Let's see. Notice that not all the principal components have the same eigenvalue. It is always sorted in a descending order. This E minus 0, 3 means 10 to the power minus 3. So these are very small values versus this is something like 4.15. 0, 0 doesn't mean anything. This is like 2.14. This is like 0. 0.52. This is how you should read it. Now, how do we decide how important each principal component is? What we can do is we can divide each eigenvalue by the total eigenvalue. And that is something which is done using this attribute called explained variance ratio. So let me just run this. You would see that the first principal component alone contributes 59%. The second principal component alone contributes 35%. Explained variance ratio tells us about the relative importance of a principal component. This total would add up to 100%. But I can see that the first two alone cross 90%. This is almost 60% and this is another 30%. Which means if I leave aside everything else and study only these two columns, that will be as good as capturing 90% of information in the data. So let's extract these seven principal components first and then we will see how does the data look like. So we are storing it as the extracted loadings. What is the input that we are providing? We are providing the input as the eigenvectors. We are doing a transpose of that so that we get these in a proper order. So just to make it appear a little familiar, we are giving proper column titles and we are also keeping the index as per the columns in the original data. Now, when you see this output, a lot of things will get cleared. So remember, each PC can be written as a linear combination of the original features. We saw it in our theory video that we can write each PC as the coefficients times the variable plus the coefficient times the variable and so on and so forth. These eigenvectors are nothing but those coefficients. We got them here. So we are using the eigenvectors together with the variables to understand how each principal component is written. We can visualize the same information related to explained variance ratio using something that's known as the scree plot. That's one and the same information. We can create a line plot where we take the explained variance ratio on the y-axis and the principal component on the x-axis. Notice the range function starts from the lower value but doesn't include the upper value. So it will go from one to seven and we are putting a proper marker with X and Y axis labels and a plot title. So let's see this output. It's conveying one and the same thing that we saw. First principal component was almost 60%. Second was a little over 30% and so on and so forth. So in this plot also, we can look for an elbow, let's say at this point or this point where we put our threshold. If we say that we want to explain up to 90% of the variation in the data, then we may take only two principal components. If we want to include more, then we may take three principal components. Generally, anything above 80 is considered good, so we'll be just fine with two principal components in this case. Imagine we had seven columns to begin with, but we are saying studying only two columns is as good as studying 90% of the data. That much information is captured with these two columns alone. So the remaining five columns would not be used by us. Let's do a cumulative sum of the explained variance ratio to get that exact number. So as you can see, first two principal components, this can be rounded up to 90%. The moment we include the third principal component, it goes to 97% of the year. So we'll be just fine with first two principal components. From the extracted loadings above, we are only selecting the first two columns. We'll use double square brackets for these and store them as DF selected. What does it look like? Just the two columns of the earlier data set. Now let us try to interpret these principal components. To what extent does a principal component depend on the features? See, we know that principal component one alone is capable of explaining 60% of the variability in the data. But we would further want to dig a little deeper to understand how is it that this principal component is associated with the original features? Because that's something which is relatable. That's something we understand. So we'll do a simple visualization for both the PCs to look at the relative importance of these values. These values will be just represented in another way. We have only two columns, so we'll divide the plotting area into two rows and one column. It's a repeated exercise, so we've done it through a for loop. If you have more PCs, this will come very handy in that case. Right? We are saying we want to consider the absolute values. It doesn't matter what the sign of the coefficient or the loading is. What matters is the magnitude. So we are taking the absolute values and we are visualizing these values like a bar plot. Let me run this and then you'll get more clarity, right? So PC1, this is the same information represented like a bar plot here. 
PC1 is most important for you, within PC1, what is more important? The ash content, followed by the carbohydrate content, followed by the fat content, followed by the sodium content. The moisture and calories, not that important for PC1. See, eigen is a term which means characteristics. You're getting to know the characteristics of the principal component by looking at it like this. So what is it that PC1 is made up of? Made up of everything that we had originally in the data. But what does it give a relatively high weightage to these pieces? Similarly, PC2, if you see, gives a relatively higher weightage to calories and moisture. It is different in terms of its characteristics. PC1 is relatively more important. PC2 is also important because PC1 and PC2 taken together is 90% of the variability in my data. We can also visualize it in a more sophisticated way if you want to do something like a heat map, take the selected data and do a heat map, kind of highlight the values. So clearly it shows a difference in the values that the variables attain for PC1 versus the values the variables attain for PC2. Now, this is still not complete because we have not completed the transformation yet. We've just looked at the coefficients or the loadings. This is what we have so far. Let's see how do we actually derive the principal components. Remember, principal component is a linear combination of all the coefficients multiplied by the variable values. Once again, I encourage you to watch the theory part of this video. It'll make a lot of things clearer to you. In case you don't have that necessary background, it'll really help you. So what I'm showing is that I'll take the first row of my original scaled data, where I'll have the values for all these variables, and I will multiply those values with the coefficients to derive the first row of the transformed data, which will be one cell for PC1 and PC2. I'll show you an easier way to get it because this is available through a ready code, but I'm just showing it manually to give you an idea as to how this works. So what I'm doing is I'm taking the first row of the original scaled data where all these variable values were there. What I'm saying is that I want to multiply these values with the coefficients as I have for the principal components. I could have simply done it in one row, but I'm putting it through a loop because you may be having data which has multiple columns and then it'll come very handy. So we are looking at PC score. PCA is nothing but a transformation on the data. It transforms the original data into a data set which is free from correlations. And of course, it reduces the number of columns. So we originally had seven columns. We'll be left with just two columns in our data now. Let's just do this exercise. These are the original values, as you can see, in the row one of selected data. I'll scroll up to show you that data quickly. These are the values that we have in the scale data. These are the same values that we got there just now by selecting DFPCA selected zero. Same values here, right? And these are the loadings. We are going to multiply loadings with the corresponding variable values. We're doing this here. And this generates the first row of the transform data, which has PC1 as 3.79 and PC2 as 2.63. This was done just to explain how is this calculation happening. But in Python, luckily, we already have a library that will take care of this entire piece for us. So now we are going to fit only two principal components. We started with seven to do the entire analysis to get the explained variance ratio and scree plot, etc. Now that we've zeroed down to two principal components, we'll get just that much. And if I show you the output, just showing you the first 10 rows of the transformed data, notice these values completely tally. The first set of values calculated by us are identical as what the function gives. So you can directly use this function and get this output. Now let's check if these two PCs actually have any correlation. The whole idea of PCA was that you will not find any correlation after you've done PCA. The data should be free from correlations. Let's check how are these two principal components related. For this, we'll once again do a heat map. It'll be a smaller heat map because we have limited variables. See, your diagonal elements are one, which is a correlation of the variable with itself. But when we talk about the correlation between principal component one and principal component two, these values are zero, which means you've been able to come to a stage where the principal components have been derived and the transform data that you've obtained is free from correlations. So this was all about the principal component analysis from the hands-on perspective. Thank you.